In today's episode, we'll continue the story of Chandrakantha, where the evil mastermind Kroor Singh allies with another evil mastermind, Maharaj Shivdat, and his all-powerful IRs. Plus, cryptic poems and secret passwords that could just save Prince Virendra's life. Welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast that will take you on a journey through the rich mythology, folklore and history of the Indian subcontinent. I am Narad Muni, the celestial storyteller and the original Time Lord. With my ability to travel through space and time, I can bring you fascinating stories from the past, the present and the future. From the epic tales of the Mahabharata and Ramayan to the folk tales of the Panchatantra, to stories of Akbar Birbal and Tenali Raman. I have a story for every occasion. The purpose of the stories is neither to pass judgment nor to indoctrinate. My goal is only to share these stories with people who may not have heard them before and to make them more entertaining for those who have. In this episode, we are continuing the story of Chandrakanta. This is a fantasy slash science fiction novel written by Devaki Nandan Khatri over a century ago. If you have not heard previous Chandrakanta episodes, that is fine. I'll recap the story so far. But I do recommend that you check out the links in the show notes and on the site sfipodcast.com. Prince Virendra of Naugad and Princess Chandrakanta of neighboring Vijaygad were in love. To be clear, they were in love with each other. Chandrakanta's father was against their union. Originally, everyone, including both sets of parents, had agreed that Virendra and Chandrakanta would marry. But enter Kroor Singh. Kroor Singh was the son of Vijaygarh's minister. And he was also his assassin. And I mean assassin quite literally. Besides figuratively poisoning the king's mind, Kroor Singh had literally poisoned his father's drink. The rather casual way in which he deliberately committed patricide should inform you that Kroor Singh was a principal villain in the story. Villains are usually motivated by money, power or love. In Kroor Singh's case, it was all three. He wanted to marry Chandrakanta, become king and access all the power and money that the position guaranteed. Patricide was simply the first step. Kroor Singh would get to be the next minister because nepotism. Then he would find a way to eliminate the king as well. Most of the characters in the story were helped by very special sidekicks called Iyars. You could argue that the Iyars were the real heroes because they did all the real work. Iyars were a cross between mystique from the X-Men, James Bond, and Sherlock Holmes. Because they could shapeshift, they had access to futuristic technology, and they were experts at chemistry. Rival IRs were constantly locked in a cat-and-mouse game, trying to trick each other. Virendra's IR, Tate Singh, had outwitted and imprisoned Ahmed one of Kroor Singh's IRs. Only Tej Singh and his brother-in-law and fellow IR Devi Singh knew about the beautiful valley where Ahmed was being held. Kroor Singh's other IR, Nazim, had at one point been caught 
by Chandrakanta's ayars, Champa and Chapla. But he managed to escape. A bit more back and forth, until Kroor Singh and Nazim discovered Virendra and Tej Singh in Chandrakanta's garden. They immediately did their civic and selfish duty by warning the king. But when the king got there, Virendra and Tej had already escaped. A mysterious person in rags had appeared out of nowhere and warned them of the king's impending arrival. The result was that the king thought Kroor Singh had been lying to him. Kroor Singh and Nazim were severely punished. Out of resentment and in an effort to escalate this game, they both travelled to the empire of Chunargarh, seeking help from Maharaj Shivdat against the crafty Tej Singh. But in their absence, Tej continued being crafty. In disguise as Kroor Singh's servant, he tricked the king into thinking that Kroor Singh had turned traitor. And as a result, the king exiled Kroor Singh's household staff. He also took over all of his property and gave Tej Singh a handsome reward as well. That's where we'll continue the story today. Kroor Singh and Nazim stepped through the grand archway into Chinargarh. Their jaws dropped at the sight. The place was absolutely fabulous. Say, boss, did you ever consider trying to take over Chunargad instead? This place makes the Vijaygad palace look like a jopri. A jopri is a hut, but I bet you smart listeners already knew that or figured it out. Boss, this fort is at least 25 elephants tall, Nazim said, obviously betraying the absence of the metric system. Sounds like high maintenance for the staff. How do you know how tall it is, anyway? Kroor Singh challenged. Did anyone stack 25 elephants to check its height? No, boss. See, it says here on the tourist brochure, Nazim said, handing Kroor Singh a glossy printed brochure. Eat at Joe Singh's? He sings as you eat? Oops, wrong page, boss. Here, look at those towers. They are so massive. The towers have towers of their own. And there are six moats and drawbridges. None of those need to be powered by hand. They have remote control technology. And the best part is, they have state-of-the-art Wi-Fi technology inside. Kroor Singh confessed that he had never heard of the term Wi-Fi before. What was it? Nazim explained, It's an acronym. W-I-F-I. It stands for Winged Instant Flying Information. Because anyone can send messages to each other via very carefully trained pigeons. One can simply write their message on a piece of paper and send it via pigeon to any other part of the city. They reply back the same way. It's what everyone in the whole country is raving about these days. Kroor Singh thought that all that was great. Could they send a message to the king that they wanted an audience? Nazim replied that maybe his boss was being a bit rash. They shouldn't go talk to Shivdat on an empty stomach. They should eat first. Did you know, Nazim began, quoting the brochure again, the city has 35 Bhelpuri joints. There's one near here. It's right next to a selfie spot that we must also visit again at sunrise. Kroor Singh had to caution his ayar not to let his enthusiasm run away with him. But he was hungry. So, they went to a Bhelpuri joint 
and were just about to eat when suddenly Nazim elbowed his boss and pointed to the table next to theirs. That's the king, Maharaj Shivdat, the Ayar whispered, perhaps a little too loud. Kroor Singh would have dismissed his Ayar, except the man at the next table looked at them. And Kroor Singh had a sudden chilling realization that this man was indeed Shivdat. Maybe it was the crown and royal garments that he was wearing, or maybe it was the paparazzi clustered around with mini easels and paint brushes, hastily painting away on the canvas, trying to capture the scene for the highest bidder. But this was definitely Shivdat. Maharaj, you are out here in the open all by yourself? I don't see any IRs or bodyguards around. Shivdat looked at him and smiled. Exactly. That is the entire point of having IRs. They must not be seen. And Chunargad has nothing but the best. Seven of the most powerful and stealthy IRs. The emperor observed that the two of them were foreigners. How did you guys get here? By the donkey trail? No, we came by horse, Nazim explained. Kroor Singh cleared his throat and launched into what he called a short presentation. It took an hour. Shivdat's patience had worn thin by then. So let me get this straight. You lost Nazim once, and then you lost Ahmed, whom you still haven't recovered. And then you were incompetent enough to lose two birds in one hand, when Virendra and Tej Singh were practically at your mercy. And then you got your IR whipped for it. Clearly, you can't manage IRs, and yet you expect me to lend you mine? That was a little hard to argue against. Shivdat would have gone on. But just then, the waiter came by with a note. Shivdat read it and smiled and said, Well, gentlemen, you're in luck. I will loan you four of my best IRs. What was in the note? Nazim asked. Was that waiter really your Ayar Badrinath in disguise? Can I get his autograph? Shivdat quickly said, Don't look at the waiter, look at me. I am the big boss. I call the shots here. Kroor Singh had to wonder if there was something in the note. Why had Shivdat done a sudden U-turn? There must be a catch. But Kroor Singh couldn't afford to look a gift horse in the mouth. Yes, sir. You can have four of my best IRs, Shivdat continued. In exchange, you'll pay taxes to me when you become king of Vijaygarh. Kroor Singh still didn't know what the catch was. A promise to pay taxes was no problem. Besides, he could change his mind after he became king, could he not? What if you change your mind? Shivdat asked. I do need some kind of a guarantee. Kroor Singh drew himself up to his full height. Kroor Singh gives you his word, he said. Shivdat said, I don't want Kroor Singh's word, I want your word. Kroor Singh had to clarify that his name was Kroor Singh and not the Betaj Badshah. That had just been a fancy title he put on his slideshow. Shivdat seemed to accept that. He told them to come to the palace the next morning. Meanwhile, back in Vijaygarh, a very different kind of a conversation was taking place. Chandrakanta's mom and dad were talking. 
I called it a conversation, except it was more of a monologue. The queen, Ratnaprabha, was speaking her mind. It's all your fault, she told the king. You always trusted that rat, Krur Singh. And all the while, he was getting ready to spit in our faces as he stabbed us in the back. The king thought that he had her there. First of all, rats could not stab anyone. They could not reliably hold a knife. No matter what Pixar films tried to tell you. It was questionable if they could spit into anyone's face. They were so tiny. And what's more, it was physically impossible for a person to stab someone in the back while also spitting in their faces. Maybe a particularly long-limbed octopus might manage it. But certainly not a human. And definitely not a rat. But Ratnaprabha had already moved on to a different topic. She was talking about Virendra now. The queen was saying that they had to re-examine everything Kroor Singh had ever told them. And come to think of it, the secret conspiracy papers, the doodles of the king in a less than respectful position, and the trick spider that had been hidden in the king's crown. All of those were in theory done by Virendra. But the only evidence for that had been Kroor Singh's testimony. All that had to be questioned again. So, the queen concluded, Virendra and Chandrakanta should marry. All the preparations that we did, we can just continue them. We just need to change the dates on the wedding invites. All right, dear, said the king. I'll ask the clerical staff to get started on it right away. Maybe they ought to have also informed Virendra or his father of this decision. But somehow, it didn't come up. Let's go back to Chunargad. It was the next morning. Kroor Singh and Nazim stood facing Maharaj Shivdat. The emperor was in his throne room and he asked, Well, Kroor Singh, are you ready to go back to Vijaygarh with four of the best IRs? Five IRs, your majesty, Nazim corrected. He was an IR himself and he wanted it to be known that he was amongst the best too. Four IRs and that one, Shivdath retorted. Yes, I am, Kroor Singh said quickly putting a stopper on this sort of thing. The last thing he wanted was for Shivdat to get upset and to withdraw his support. Well, take them and go. What are you waiting for? A pat on the back? Shivdat asked. Kroor Singh glanced around, but there was no one else there. And then he noticed something. The empty chair in the room shook and slowly morphed into the shape of a man. You? You're an Ayar! Kroor Singh exclaimed. He poked Nazim in the ribs and whispered, Look, you may learn something from him. Yes, said Shivdat. This is Ram Narayan, the raider of Rai Bareli, the Rana killer of Ranthambore. We also call him Mr... Chairman. Well, let's get rocking, Ram Narayan said out loud. At those words, there was a vacuum cleaner in the corner that shimmered and changed into a person. Another Ayar. Shivdat introduced this one as well. Pannalal, the terror of Tihar, the nimble-footed Nagpur spy. You saw him in his best disguise. He's been gathering dirt on all my enemies. Nazim was awestruck. You guys have to teach me how you do all that. You guys are amazing. The chandelier 
gently came down off the ceiling. It too was an ayar in disguise. This was Bhagwan Dutt, the scourge of Surat, and the bane of Bhopal. Nazim and Kroor Singh began looking around for the fourth ayar, Badrinath. Has he secretly disguised as my horse? Or my turban? Or maybe he's that goblet over there? Kroor Singh said excitedly. They were still searching when Badrinath, totally in human form, cleared his throat and said, Guys, I'm right here. Kroor Singh and Nazim looked wide-eyed. Had Badrinath been one of the silver teaspoons on the king's table? No, I just walked in the door, he said. Wow, Kroor Singh thought. With powers like these at his disposal, he was sure to become king of Vijaygarh in no time. Badrinath merely shook his head. He had seen his fair share of crazy clients. He only supposed that his boss, Shivdath, knew what he was doing. Kroor Singh, his four world-class Ayars and Nazim were about to head back when news arrived. It was one of Kroor Singh's former servants, here to complain about how the king of Vijaygarh had discovered Kroor Singh's absence and punished and exiled everyone in Kroor Singh's home. Kroor Singh heard all this with increasing fury. When he further heard about Ahmed returning and about Ramlal betraying him, his suspicions were confirmed. Because if Ahmed had really escaped as he claimed, he would have come straight here, and he hadn't. Shivdath had his men check the visitor logs. Besides, Kroor Singh didn't recall a servant named Ramlal. That meant all of this was Tate Singh's handiwork. Don't worry, Badrinath said. When we are through, Tate Singh won't even know what hit him. Kroor Singh said that he wanted Tate Singh to know what hit him. Badrinath had to clarify that it was just an expression, signifying the sudden shock of defeat that Tate Singh was about to experience. Take Pandit Jagannath too, Shivdat said. Nazim and Kroor Singh were shocked, but pleased, extremely pleased. Pandit Jagannath, the juggernaut, the jaggery-eating Jwalamukhi of Jaipur, the astrologer supreme. Jagannath could predict the future, and that was going to come in handy. With ominous intent, Kroor Singh, the Ayars, and the astrologer set out for the towers of Vijaygarh to bring doom and destruction. Let's go over to Naukad. Virendra and Tej Singh were near the Vijaygarh border, as usual. Tej Singh was going on and on about something, but Virendra wasn't paying attention. He had a glazed look in his eyes. He was still thinking about Chandrakanta. Virendra, are you listening? Teja asked again. Huh? What? Yes, of course, Virendra said, when he clearly was not. It wasn't often that Tej Singh would lose patience, but this seemed like it might become one of those cases. But we never get to find out, because the two of them were interrupted. There was a Rishi, a holy man, who had appeared out of nowhere. He was walking by and singing loudly. It's twilight and the spies are coming. Over Virendra, danger is looming. Badrinath and Pannalal, their secret spin. Rise up, prince, or you might not win. Bhagwandat and Ram Narayan conspire. 
Vijaygad and Navgad, their prime desire. But Jagannath's the tricky one. He knows what you've done before you've done it. What did he mean? Virendra asked. The holy man over there. Was he talking about me? No, don't worry, Tej Singh said. He was talking about a different Prince Virendra of a different Naugad. Yeah, I've sometimes received letters addressed to this other prince, delivered to me by mistake. Something about credit card offers and an extended warranty for my chariot. Gosh, he added with a sudden realization. What if Chandrakanta's letters accidentally get delivered to this other Prince Virendra of this other Naugad? Tej Singh pointed out that there was no danger of that, seeing as he, Tej Singh, was the one who was delivering all of those letters. Now listen, the IR told the prince. I must be off. I have to go see what Kroor Singh is up to. He is probably getting some help from Shivdat. I'll go out on a limb here, but my money is on Badrinath, Ram Narayan, Pannalal, Bhagwandat, and Jagannath. Just like the ones in the poem, Virendra observed. Yup, just another coincidence. Virendra should have realized that every bit of the poem was relevant to him. But his mind was still on Chandrakanta. Tej Singh continued, I have to give you some very strict instructions. I need your full attention here. You absolutely have my full attention, Virendra said, half attentively. Tej Singh rattled off a few rules. From now on, Virendra had to look at everyone and everything with suspicion. Even if Tej Singh himself came back, it might not be Tej Singh. Don't take candy from strangers or from friends. Don't accept any food. Don't smell any flowers or perfume that anyone offers you. You and I will need a secret password so we can confirm each other's identity. Can the password be Chandrakanta? Virendra asked, dreamily. But Tej Singh said it was too obvious. They haggled and ultimately ended on Chandrakanta, but with all the letters A substituted with the at symbol. It was a reasonable compromise. No one else in that century knew what an at symbol was, so this might work. And lastly, Tej Singh added, here, Look at this tiny part of my left eyebrow. There's a tiny mole there. No one else knows about it. If I come back to you and I don't show you my mole, you'll know that it's not me. It's a mole. I mean, it's an IR in disguise. Tay Singh got on his horse and sped away towards Vijaygad, knowing that he was now up against the most powerful IRs and Pandit Jagannath. And these would be a lot tougher to handle than Nazim and Ahmed. Big dangers await Tej Singh and Virendra. But we'll have to wait for a future episode to find out what they are exactly. That's it for this time. Check out the links in the show notes and on the site sfipodcast.com for previous Chandrakanta episodes. In the next episode, we are going back to the Ramayan, as some of you requested, with a fierce battle continuing between the Vanars and the Lankans. There may be more surprises in store from both sides. Thank you all for the comments on social media and on Spotify's Q&A. I can't directly reply to the questions there, but I'll address them here on this show. I'm thrilled to be the number one podcast for so many of you. Thank you for all your love and support. Tea and coffee? Really glad you and your mom enjoy this podcast. Thank you for your support. Nivedita and Anivar, 
Thank you so much. It's always heartwarming to hear your kind words. And Nivedita, you certainly can. More power and encouragement to you if you want to try it out. Harihar, Bala, Vishrut and Moshroom, thank you for the support as always. Arush, I haven't forgotten about the Indus Valley Civilization story and I appreciate your patience. Hari Prasad, yes, Surasamharam has to do with Murugan's victory over Surapadman. That's a separate story from the one about defeating Tarakasur, but they're not very different. Mamta, I hope you liked today's Chandrakanta episode. Hema, indeed, yes, though both Ayapa and Kartikeya are sons of Shiva, Ayapa's mother is Mohini, the avatar of Vishnu during the Sagar Manthan, or the churning of the ocean. Vishrut, yes, we will start on Punni in Selvan soonish. Since it's mostly fiction, I can't simply tell you the story from my memory. That means I just need some time to research it a bit more. I do intend to narrate Tipu Sultan's story. Thank you for your patience, Darsh. And regarding the last episode, you are correct that I'm immortal. But I still could not help being scared of Shiva at that moment, especially considering what Shiva had done to Kamdev, who is a bona fide god and immortal as well. Parasasabhi, I do wish you a very happy birthday. I don't have a story on Hanuman this week, but in next week's story, Hanuman plays an important role. So look out for that. Thal, I wish you a happy birthday as well. Look out for the Purni and Selvan story to come up very soon. If you have any other comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories that you'd like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or reply to the questions on Spotify's Q&A. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to send me an email, it's storiesfromindiapodcast at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.